Hi everyone! So in this video we are going to introduce the concepts of social stratification and social class and we're also going to take a closer look at the distribution of wealth in the United States. So in the second half of the semester we're going to be focusing specifically on systems of social inequalities and as we'll unveil through our remaining discussions in this semester a lot of the inequalities in the United States are centered on uh, Inequal, unequal distributions of income and wealth in our society, which is what this topic of social stratification largely has to do with. So if you think back to the beginning of the semester, you'll hopefully remember the exercise we did with the fictional character named Mason. Um, and Mason, if you remember, was really struggling trying to get a job. And at the surface, a lot of people in Mason's life, Mason's life blame Mason as an individual for not being able to get a job. They said Mason was lazy, that Mason shouldn't have had kids, that Mason wasn't working hard enough, etc. But then as we completed this exercise, we unveiled that Mason actually had a really great work ethic. Mason was doing everything in their power to get a job, but it was these larger social forces, right? These social structures that were preventing Mason from getting hired, right? Mason was being discriminated against because of her gender, because of her family status, because of her religion, because of her gendered presentation. All of these different forces were preventing Mason from getting a job. So this idea that there's these larger structural forces in place that prevent individuals' ability to move up in terms of social class uh, has to do with this concept of social stratification. So social stratification refers to a society's categorization of people uh, into rankings of socioeconomic tiers, often based off of factors including wealth, income, race, education, and power. Social stratification is a characteristic of a society, not a matter of individual differences. So what this essentially means, again, is that from a sociological perspective, we're more interested in understanding patterns of human behavior rather than just focusing on individual accounts of behaviors. And social stratification helps us see how members of a society get organized into these different tiers at this structural level. So there's always going to be individual exceptions to the rules of social stratification. For example, some people that are born into lower social classes will be able to quote unquote, pull themselves up by the bootstraps and improve their socioeconomic standing and move up in terms of their social class and improve their ranking of social stratification. However, it's very important to recognize that all of the research in sociology unequivocally supports the claim that it is not always enough to work hard, which means that the American dream that we have all been socialized to believe since we were children is a myth, right? Some people will do everything in their power, they will work as hard as they possibly can, and they will not be able to move up in terms of social class. They will not be able to improve their socioeconomic standing. And it's because there's these structures of inequality in place that are bigger than any one individual that prevent a number of individuals from moving up in social class. So the structure of society affects a person's social standing. Although individuals may support or fight inequalities, social stratification is created and supported by society as a whole. In other words, we can think of this uh, in terms of we as a society created this system of social stratification. We as a society created these different social classes that we have. We've created the laws and policies that are put in place that are supposed to protect individuals and distribute wealth equally in the United States. But as we'll see today, the distribution of wealth in the U.S. is anything but equal. So when we're talking about social classes, we're referring to groups of people that are similar in terms of income, education, power, and prestige in any given society. In the United States, uh, generally when we're talking about social class, we organize people into five tiers. So uh, each one of these tiers is supposed to represent 20% of our overall population. So the poorest 20% of our population often is referred to as the lower class. The 20% above that, the lower middle class, 20% above that, the middle class, 20% above that, upper middle class, and then the richest, the wealthiest 20% of our population is largely referred to as the upper class. So social class is typically an inherited trait, which means that the social class we are born into will likely be the social class we occupy at least for the first several decades of our lives. It is possible for people to move up in social class, right? Some people will always be exceptions to the rules, 
For example, if you were born in a lower class family, maybe neither of your parents had a college education and you were privileged enough to receive that education, it is likely that you could secure a higher paying job than your parents and move up to either lower middle class or even to a middle class lifestyle. So upward social mobility, something we'll talk about later, is possible, but it is difficult and it is not something that is accessible to everyone. When we're talking about social class, uh, we're usually referring to the amount of the three P's that an individual occupies. The first P refers to property, or which are your material possessions. So property includes uh, things like an individual's wealth, which is the value of an individual's property minus any debts that they owe. So for example, the value of your home, automobile, etc., minus the debt that you owe on those uh, physical things. Uh, property also includes an individual's income, which is typically the amount of money a person is paid for a particular job. Uh, the second P refers to power, and we'll use the definition that we've already been using uh, from a conflict theorist perspective here to refer to power as an individual's ability to get their way despite resistance from others. And the last P is prestige, which refers to the respect that's associated with an individual's status, particularly the occupation they hold. So let's talk about the way wealth is distributed across the different social classes in the United States. I'd like you to think, uh, what percentage of wealth do you think each of these five social classes occupies in the US? Right? So if you were a total, total optimist and thought that everyone was really equal in the United States, you might say that, well, uh, since each of the social classes represents 20% of our population, each of the five social classes should occupy 20% of our nation's wealth. Of course, that's not the case, right? We know that people have different levels of income, different socioeconomic statuses, but what might surprise you is just how jarring these disparities between the amount of wealth certain classes hold in comparison to others. So for example, the lower class, the poorest 20% of Americans only occupy less than 1% of our nation's wealth. In fact, the poorest 40% of Americans still don't occupy a single percent of our nation's wealth. Moving up to the middle class, which is what the majority of Americans self-identify as, the poorest 60% of Americans, Americans who qualify as lower class, lower middle class, and middle class, occupy less than 5% of our nation's wealth. Moving up now to the upper middle class, even when we look at the poorest 80%, of Americans. They only occupy about 10% of our nation's wealth, which means that the upper class, the richest 20% of Americans, occupy almost 90% of our nation's wealth. So think about how jarring those disparities are in terms of the way that wealth is distributed throughout the United States. We're going to watch a video clip here that does a good job further explaining There's this disparity. There's a chart disparity. I saw recently that I can't get out of my head. A Harvard business professor and economist asked more than 5,000 Americans how they thought wealth was distributed in the United States. This is what they said they thought it was. Dividing the country into five rough groups of the top, bottom, and middle three 20% groups, they asked people how they thought the wealth in this country was divided. Then he asked them what they thought was the ideal distribution. And 92%, that's at least nine out of 10 of them, said it should be more like this. In other words, more equitable than they think it is. Now that fact is telling, admittedly, the notion that most Americans know that the system is already skewed unfairly. But what's most interesting to me is the reality compared to our perception. The ideal is as far removed from our perception of reality as the actual distribution is from what we think exists in this country. So ignore the ideal for a moment. Here's what we think it is again. And here is the actual distribution. Shockingly skewed. Not only do the bottom 20% and the next 20%, the bottom 40% of Americans barely have any of the wealth. I mean, it's hard to even see them on the chart. But the top 1% has more of the country's wealth than 9 out of 10 Americans believe the entire top 20% should have. Mind-blowing. But let's look at it another way, because I find this chart kind of difficult to wrap my head around. Instead, let's reduce the 311 million Americans to just a representative 100 people. Make it simple. Here they are. 
teachers, coaches, firefighters, construction workers, engineers, doctors, lawyers, some investment bankers, a CEO, maybe a celebrity or two. Now let's line them up according to their wealth. Poorest people on the left, wealthiest on the right, just a steady row of folks based on their net worth. We'll color code them like we did before based on which 20% quintile they fall into. Now, let's reduce the total wealth of the United States, which was roughly $54 trillion in 2009, to this symbolic pile of cash. And let's distribute it among our 100 Americans. Well, here's socialism, all the wealth of the country distributed equally. We all know that won't work. We need to encourage people to work and work hard to achieve that good old American dream and keep our country moving forward. So. Here's that ideal we asked everyone about, something like this curve. This isn't too bad. We've got some incentive as the wealthiest folks are now about 10 to 20 times better off than the poorest Americans. But hey, even the poor folks aren't actually poor since the poverty line has stayed almost entirely off the chart. We have a super healthy middle class with a smooth transition into wealth. And yes, Republicans and Democrats alike chose this curve. Nine out of 10 people, 92%, said this was a nice, ideal distribution of America's wealth. But let's move on. This is what people think America's wealth distribution actually looks like. Not as equitable, clearly, but for me, even this still looks pretty great. Yes, the poorest 20 to 30% are starting to suffer quite a lot compared to the ideal, and the middle class is certainly struggling more than they were, while the rich and wealthy are making roughly a hundred times that of the poorest Americans and about 10 times that of the still healthy middle class. Sadly, this isn't even close to the reality. Here is the actual distribution of wealth in America. The poorest Americans don't even register. They're down to pocket change and the middle class is barely distinguishable from the poor. In fact, even the rich between the top 10 and 20 percentile are worse off. Only the top 10% are better off. And how much better off? So much better off that the top two to 5% are actually off the chart at this scale. And the top 1%, this guy, well, his stack of money stretches 10 times higher than we can show. Here's his stack of cash restacked all by itself. This is the top 1% we've been hearing so much about. So much green in his pockets that I have to give him a whole new column of his own because he won't fit on my chart. 1% of America has 40% of all the nation's wealth. The bottom 80%, eight out of every 10 people, or 80 out of these 100, only has 7% between them. And this has only gotten worse in the last 20 to 30 years. While the richest 1% take home almost a quarter of the national income today, in 1976, they took home only 9%, meaning their share of income has nearly tripled in the last 30 years. The top 1% own half the country's stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. The bottom 50% of Americans own only half a percent of these investments, which means they aren't investing. They're just scraping by. I'm sure many of these wealthy people have worked very hard for their money. But do you really believe that the CEO is working 380 times harder than his average employee? N not his lowest paid employee, not the janitor, but the average earner in his company. The average worker needs to work more than a month to earn what the CEO makes in one hour. We certainly don't have to go all the way to socialism to find something that is fair for hardworking Americans. We don't even have to achieve what most of us consider might be ideal. All we need to do is wake up and realize that the reality in this country is not at all what we think it is. Wow. So a lot of information to take in there, right? Just to quickly summarize some of the statistics, uh, the richest 400 Americans own more than the bottom 150 million Americans. That's nearly half of our nation's population. As it was mentioned in the video, the top 1% of the U.S. holds 40% of our nation's wealth, uh, and the bottom 80% of the U.S. only holds about 10%. 
Uh, and this is a problem that's gotten increasingly bad uh, over the past several decades. The top 1% of the U.S. population makes about 25% of our nation's income, but about 50 years ago they only made 7%. So in the next video we'll uh, further discuss the complications of this distribution of wealth and we'll also take a look at uh, social mobility.